Oh, that's better. Uh-oh. You were marked down. Yes, that's right, Mark is stripping. Margie, I didn't know you could move that fast. Don't get in your pants. Out. Hey everyone, it is uh, Monday, shortly after noon actually. I'm following Mark here, I hope he makes it. We have a fairly old four-wheeler that uh, we don't use very much anymore and Jack takes it once a year to do a four-wheeling trip with our with Mark's cousin and a bunch of guys and uh, he messaged us from Montreal where he's doing a big robotic install. We dug it out but the batteries don't stay charged so we have a really handy uh, neighbor who does a lot of our uh, vehicle maintenance and he can pretty much fix anything so anyway we're gonna take a couple seconds right now and do that because this afternoon I got a pretty busy afternoon I want to uh, the feed cart has been acting up a bit and then Rex is coming and we're scanning our sheep that are hopefully due in December so I'm a little nervous and then I should probably seal up those uh, those silage bags too if uh, there's no more poisonous gas coming out of it today is also Mark and I's uh, 24th wedding anniversary so uh, we've been together a long time One's done. I'm not so sure about the other one yet because there was a lot of gas coming out of it yesterday, but we'll go check. Looks like most of the gas is already gone. Look at that though, it pretty much burnt the grass. So I might just cut a chunk and then uh, do what I just did over on that other bag and then both those will be sealed. Alright, now I talked to Mark about this belt and he said it's probably easier to just start with the belt I have on it even though I bought the right belt today. Otherwise, I have to take the pulley off to get this belt on. It's the belt that runs the hydraulic, and the hydraulic runs the, uh, basically, forward and back on this cart. Okay, so I'm going to show you this maze of the belt. So, basically, to get at this little belt here, I have to take this belt off just off this, it's, that's not a big deal. The problem is I have to take this pulley off way down here and it's not as easy as it might appear. So right now, there is a little tightener down here. There's quite a bit of room here that I can still move it. And if that doesn't do it, then I'll put on the new belt because this belt's like two sizes too big. Okay, I changed my mind. I uh, put the new belt on. This one was just a little loose. Even I got it as tight as I possibly could get that tightener and it was still really loose. So as long as I put this on the right way, uh, I'm gonna test it out here and, and make sure, but it does look a little, a little tighter. There's still some play there, but I couldn't move the tightener any further. So, yeah, I just, I'm always concerned I don't put stuff back the way I found it. I think we're going to go with that. 
opens? Uh, sorry? Painting the open one. Yeah. yeah. Show us a baby. Okay, Rex left. Chris had to go vote cows. I've just been cleaning up here after everybody's left. Anyway, I end up being a very good scan. Probably one of my best for July. Uh, we have 99 ladies out of 112 that are gonna have babies. So I think my math says that's a like 88%, which is unbelievable for being completely out of season. I think only two were repeat offenders. Uh, so they, they had scanned open from the April breed and now they've scanned open for the July breed. So they will go for sure. They're also getting very large. I could barely get them in the, uh, in the shoot. And then uh, the other ones were all first timer misses. So they will get one more chance and they're going into their natural breeding period. So they should breed no problem. And now I have to shower and uh, look somewhat presentable and find somewhere to go for supper with my beloved. What are you guys gonna do for supper besides eat stuff you shouldn't eat? Hmm. Morning guys, I'm just looking over this flock to figure out where to start this morning. I have to evaluate some udders and go over some weaning information on the group we weaned last. So the group before the group that just lambed. I just don't know where to start. Chris is here shortly, so maybe she can help me decide. I am gonna use my Gallagher again because I've got all their historic data on it and I need to know if they've had previous uh, previous misses with scans and all that stuff. I don't have any of that stuff transferred over onto my flock watch yet. So for the next year or so, I'm probably gonna have a lot of um, piggybacking between the two software systems. Um, and likely as each lambing group, every group starts lambing, that's probably where the transfers are gonna happen. But these guys are still on my old system, so that's what we're gonna use. All right, Chris, so we're gonna scan. And when you get to the red dot, give me a second so I can write down that they're open and see if they've had previous opens. Okay, this has become an afternoon job now. Uh, we, got, we got a whole bunch sorted and organized this morning. Um, but when I went to do the udder evaluation, I was like, have I actually gone through my weaning data yet? And I hadn't. So as Chris was feeding, I went through and marked down my, the ewes that I'm gonna ship based on 
uh, poor performance as a mom, uh, or if they had any udder issues, like only had one working teat, or had a really low, like her udder just blew apart and it was like really low and the teats were the wrong placement. Just anything like that that compromised lamb performance, or if I had to pull off lambs that I shouldn't have had to. Um, and there was quite a few that had preg talks. So I have a sheet, I have a list, I left it up in my office, so I'll have to go grab it. Hello, thank you for coming up. Okay, I have my list here. And then what I'm gonna do right now is do an udder evaluation. This is the one time that I can really get it. They've been completely dry for a strong month now, so I can get a real good feel of if there's any damage to the udder, any lumps, bumps. Uh. Um, hard lumps like if there's soft tissue I usually kind of leave it I don't know if that's right or wrong um, and then any hard canals in the teat then they have to go because typically they just don't milk out of them so yeah so it's a combination of data that I went through this morning and an actual physical evaluation without looking at her data I want to show you kind of what I do from uh, a physical perspective just looking at her overall appearance she's a She's well conditioned, so she's okay in that department. And then I look at the udder just to make sure, number one, it's fine, like the size is okay, it's not down past her hocks. Um, and then I just feel it, and it's soft, no damage, no lumps, no bumps, and the teats, have, teats are supple. <laughs> oh man, the stuff that you get to witness on a sheep YouTube channel. All right, so she is good physically, so now we actually match that to her records and see how she fares. Uh-oh. You were marked down. So this, this you actually had preg talks, so she has obviously recovered fine. And that is a shame, but if she's gone down once, I'm not taking any chances. So I'm going to ship her while she's healthy and on her feet. Because another set of babies could actually be the thing that kills her. So. So you go back over. I'll let you take for now. Coming in? That was a full day of working sheep, which is actually awesome. I love sheep management jobs, if I'm honest. So everybody's kind of sorted and organized now, which is great. Having Rex yesterday actually just made me remember. We did go through the Mady Visna comparison numbers. I gave him all my weaning data from, uh, I think it was Willow's group, I think it was the March group. And he compared what he had for the Mady Visna ewes that were showing that were positive for Mady Visna, which are quite a few. I, it's pretty prevalent in this in this farm now. But the tricky thing is, we were hoping, we're not hoping, but we were kind of hoping we would see some correlation between poor production, slow milk coming in, um, pregnancy toxemia, things like that. We were hoping that that would really draw an arrow to the positive mums, and it didn't. So. All we can do now is I'm kind of working with taking out the questionably thin ones uh, and especially if they're older. So we're kind of really critical on our 2016s and, uh, and older right now. Next year in 2023, that will be the 2017s and older, like a real hard evaluation like I did today. They will be evaluated even one more time. There was one that went through and after she walked away, I'm like, I gotta get her next time. She just looks like she was thinning out and you've seen my use, they don't just thin out unless there's uh, maybe an underlying issue there. So now we're looking for, yeah, age, 
uh, condition, body condition, and uh, like so wasting for sure if they're getting skinny and if they're starting to uh, breathe heavy. So like starting to like labor breathing. So those kind of three things, three, three things uh, is what we're looking for now. And uh, they will leave the farm when I, when I see those things, if, if I can, if they don't have a lamb on them or, or whatever. But um, yeah, so that's kind of the decision making right now that we're at because the Made Vizna results really didn't, it just didn't really clearly define anything like we hoped it would. So I just thought I'd talk about that because enough of you guys have been asking me and I haven't been ignoring. I've just, honestly, I get busy and I forget about it until I'm faced with it again. And just talking to Rex yesterday, I was like, right, I have to talk to you guys about it. So yeah, unfortunately not a lot of answers, which is sheep for you. One last thing left today to do. Willow's group, I just noticed when I was editing actually this morning, that there was one or two that were really trying to jump to get a feeder space. I'm going to give Willow's group a little more room because there's lots of room on that side now. Literally, Kinsey did all the work today and you're the one sleeping. <laughs> You're so pretty. Well, I thought uh, my day was coming to an end, but Mark needed some help. He is starting to strip till. Yes, that's right, Mark is stripping. We actually co-own this unit with uh, a neighbor and friend, and this is the first time we've used it. Uh, we ordered it a couple years ago, I think, like a while ago. It didn't come in until uh, last fall, right before the monsoon, and then we never could use it because it was just too wet. So this is the first time he's actually had it. So he asked me to come with the fence here and just push. We're kind of surrounded by a tree lot here and he just wanted me to bring the fence and push the uh, some of these trees that have fallen down through the summer uh, just so it doesn't get the cover crops hiding it a little bit so he doesn't want to get into the logs that have uh, fallen into the field here. So I'm gonna see if he comes up here if I can get a, if I can catch a ride with him and show you guys this unit. It's pretty cool. We actually got some footage on Sunday. Mark and I went for a bit of a crop tour to look at our cover crops. So I've got a little bit of footage of that morning. What's that? It's that dry. It feels hard. Super dry. Your roots. You know what? It'd be drier if you didn't have all this stuff here. Use all your nodules on your peas. Wow. Free nitrogen. Free nitrogen. So what this is using up that manure that we spread? Yeah, the, o the, the oats will, but they'll also live off a bit of the nitrogen from the peas. Right. Um, so as those nodules die and the, or the peas die and the leaches out, the oats can use it. That's oh, nice. And same with the sunflowers. What does the sunflower root look like? Just a it's just more a like tap a tap root. root? Yeah. Nice. Buckwheat's is kind of like a tap root as well. These are the oats. Buckwheat. Buckwheat's got such a pretty little flower. Yep. The bees love it. I bet. I love it. Okay, just before I go home, I thought I would give you the lowdown on these strips because Mark's just, he's doing the headlands and the headlands are so stressful. It's the first day of looking 
into the barrel, if you know what I mean, the harvest barrel. <laughs> yeah, the honeymoon's over. <laughs> we have been strip tilling for quite a few years. The only time we don't strip till uh, our land for our corn, for next year for corn, is if we're tiling a field or if the weather isn't conducive and we can't get in here in good time to do it. Uh, after wheat, if you remember, we spread manure, work it in, plant cover crops, and then we let the cover crops grow as basically as long as we can and we either terminate them or uh, just let winter kill them. Typically Mark likes to terminate it just so we don't have a lot of volunteer uh, things pop their ugly heads in the spring to deal with um, and they've kind of already done done what they're supposed to do which is fix nitrogen and there is residue there even when it dies there is some residue there that helps just protect the soil. So what we're trying to do with strips is not disturb the whole field uh, in regards to the soil. We're trying to, to conserve as much soil and, and earthworms and all the things that we need to keep our soils really healthy because then it makes our crops really healthy. Mark's been uh, trying to find a strip till that he, that he really likes and this seems to be the winner so far, but it's day one. So that's kind of the logic behind uh, strip till is to basically keep tillage at a minimum uh, it also helps with workloads. So in the spring, I don't have to work a whole bunch of ground like I did this past spring. And the other thing it does is it doesn't disturb the stones. So we don't have to go through and pick stones for days on end. So it's just a great practice. It's not completely no-till. Uh, Mark still likes to have just that nice little worked seed bed just for, just for where our corn gets planted. Uh, that's his, it's kind of more ideal for us anyway. Good morning guys. I was about to leave here and realized my truck is on dangerously low amounts of fuel. So I'm going to fuel up. Uh, I'm heading to the vet clinic first thing this morning. I'm picking up some vaccine that I ordered a couple weeks ago and it's been in. I just haven't had a chance to go pick it up. And then I'm meeting Chris across the road. We are going to select some uh, ewe lambs, some ewe lambs from that big June group. I hadn't decided uh, when we first took them over there if I needed them. After sorting yesterday and seeing how many are going to be leaving us later today, I'm like, I better keep some. Okay, we are getting ready here. I made a discovery about Glamvac uh, between Belinda and I this last few weeks. And uh, if you read the fine, fine print, actually, did I find it or did I tell you I found it online on this stuff? Anyway, no, you're so. Tazvax didn't have it, I don't think. Or I, maybe I found it on Tazvax. I didn't find it on this. I found it online. Anyways, long story short, you are supposed to discard any vaccine you don't use when you open up a bottle. And you have to really look for that little disclaimer. So I was, uh, I panicked for three hours and then um, I texted my vet and he's like, okay, first of all, just relax. And second of all, they do it because uh, how I usually do this, I just take a syringe and we just take it out, jab a lamb, do another one. So I'm basically contaminating the bottle, which all you guys are probably yelling at your screens telling me not to do that. So I did go out and buy another one of these. I don't love, like I love them, but I don't love them because it's hard to get my hand in that um, unit because they're bouncing around. So this is long, it's pretty long, whereas the syringe is pretty short. So that's why I haven't been doing it. But he said, if you keep this clean you can reuse it within a certain amount of days um, but when you keep drawing and needling out of the same needle that's when contamination can happen. I think that's all the housekeeping. So one mil we're gonna be looking for replacement use. I'm basically looking at overall confirmation. Feet and legs are really hard to see in this unit. That's the only thing I don't like about this system is I can't really see them walking. Kind of their weight gain, their genetics, so who's the mom, who's the dad's breed. Yeah, so I'm really looking for Rito sired ewe lambs and they have to just meet the rest of the category kind of thing. All right, did it turn around? Yeah. Of course it did. Taking too long talking. So you can scan it already. I don't think it's, I think it's too slow. Oh, it's a ram, so we don't... And it's a ewe. Oh, it's a ewe, baby! Alright. So this is a ewe lamb, it's a steel reader 
Triplet. Oh, that's the other thing I look for is if they are a multiple, I usually try to keep the multiples. If they're just big singles, I just have to really look at them pretty hard. So this is a steel Rito cross, so I'm going to vaccinate her. You guys, you've missed a lot. We have had a big storm roll through. Uh, we didn't finish this job till noon. The sheep have still not been fed. Uh, yeah, it's been kind of a crazy wild morning. These sheep, I don't know if it's because of the weather, uh, a different system moving in, but they did not want to cooperate. So it's been quite the day. And poor Chris is on double duty this week because she's also milking cows morning and night at her other job, so I'm like, I am so sorry of all the weeks that I have all these sheep jobs to get done. I'm doing it when you are like exhausted already, so she's been such a good sport. Um, but I said at noon, I said, you go home and eat because she starts her other job at one, and I said, I will clean up and do chores and do all the things. Uh, but I was really hoping to have her back at three to help me load those those ewes to go to the auction barn. That's not going to happen. Uh, so we ended up getting quite a few females uh, selected, which is great. So we have lots. I was just saying to Carissa, you know, I was on the fence about this group. And at the same time, I'm like, the markets are really low right now. So I'm like, this is a great time to replenish my flock. Um, worst case scenario, we'll sit on them for a bit. If we end up not needing them, if the market does increase a bit, and we don't need them, then I can always ship them later. So the other little thing that we're kind of been stewing about, ruminating about, is this barn is gonna be fairly empty because that group that we just lambed out is so small. When this group is actually shipped out of here in the, over the next month, I guess just this side now, um, then all we're gonna have left in this barn are these girls, plus the 100 from the other barn, 100-ish. They'll be coming over here. So a bunch of you guys have been asking, what are you gonna do with golden girls during the winter? Cause they're right, they're literally right out here. We're gonna actually make a little pen at the back in here for them because we're gonna have a ton of room and we're gonna try and keep this barn as warm as we can to keep everything thawed. So I think that's our game plan going forward. I think the whole barn, we're gonna have our ewe lambs, we're gonna have the lambs from across the road, and then we'll have like a half a half a side available for the Golden Girls to hang out here until the spring. Hello, I haven't forgot about you. <laughs> Do you want to go outside in the rain? Well, I don't want to go out in the rain either. Where's your tail? Way over there, it's full of water. You guys, did you do that? Okay. My tails. Okay, let me get your pail. Make me go out there. Okay, hold on. Margie, I didn't know you could move that fast. Yeah. Okay, don't get in your pail. Out. Okay. Get your pail. Yeah, how mad are they gonna be, Kinsey? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> Hello, Willow. Are you hungry? Let's see the meter. Oh, no, I'm still good.